I put a lot into a message. It's good that the people of God come to hear it. Amen. <laughs> but I remember my brothers inviting me to church. And there was a time in my life I didn't want to hear anything about the gospel. I grew up in church here and there. Had a Catholic background. Catholicism. Went to a Catholic school. Did all the catechism classes and everything that was required through religion. And my brothers got saved at an early age. I wouldn't say early age, but probably around in their 20s. Then they came asking me if I wanted to go to church. And I said, no, take your Jesus and get out of here. Because I had it all figured out. Even though I was depressed. Angry man. Selling drugs, doing drugs, doing my own life. But I didn't understand this change that had happened in my brothers. I mean, no, I'm just letting the spirit move. I didn't understand the change that happened in my brothers because we had grown up in church here and there and sat in a little booth and confessed our sin to a man and thought that that was church, that that was God. But my brothers got real saved. Amen. And they came with me with all this at the time thought was nonsense. I didn't want to hear none of that. I, 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 get away from me with all that. I hadn't come to the end of myself yet. A man has to come to the end of himself. Are you hearing me, church? No one can bring you there. You have to come to the end of yourself. Before you come to a place to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have to come to the end of your life to find that place where you can't look anywhere else except up. Hallelujah. And I had come to that place in my life, but the very brothers, my younger brothers, that I used to hang with, I used to run the streets with, that I used to be in a gang with, that I used to do drugs with, are no longer doing those things. Can I get an amen? I couldn't figure it out. I said, this is, this is some kind of phase that they're going through. There's just no way. This isn't real. Amen. But every time I rejected their offer, their invitation to go to church, they kept loving on me. That's what really irritated me. Because they wouldn't get upset. <laughs> and so I would talk to them, curse at them, yell at them. I was abusive. They didn't want anything to do with them, but they kept inviting me to church. They kept asking me to come to church with them. I said, fine. Finally, I just, I had it. I said, let me go and check out this church that you supposedly found God and you invited Christ to come into your heart. I don't believe in none of that. I don't believe it's real. I've been in churches before and I've seen the hypocrisy. Amen? Let God be true and let, let every man be a liar. What that means is that God's still God even though man sometimes misrepresents who God is. <laughs> He's still God, church. <laughs> But I hadn't figured that out. So they invited me to church. My youngest brother invited me. My middle brother, actually. He said, I'm going to bring you to church. I'm going to pick you up. All right, I put my boots on and my Harley Davidson vest, leather vest on there with a tank top with no sleeves. That's, uh, you're going to tell me how I can go to church. I want to see if they're going to get on me, tell me I got to leave coming in that way had my boots, blue jeans on, and just went in there with all the pride and arrogance that I could have. Because I already was convinced that God wasn't in that place. I've been in churches before, and I know. So I went with my brother and walked into this big church, the old Lakewood, amen, where John Osteen was. Walked into this church, and I saw everybody with their hands raised up and praising God and worshiping God. And I said, this is not church. I don't understand what this is. <laughs> I've been in church before. And everybody's quiet and they're sitting down as the man is reading something from behind what looks like a pulpit. That's Catholic church. Amen. I just thought that that's the way church was supposed to be. Because that's how I grew up in the tradition of what was handed down to me from my parents. I never really experienced the power of God, but when I walked into that church, something started happening in here. I felt uncomfortable. For the first time in my life, I felt uncomfortable. 
That's the presence of God, church. That's the anointing and the spirit of God in that church. And let me tell you, the same spirit that was in that church is the same spirit that's in this church. He's called the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. He's the third member of the Godhead who still is operating in the earth today. I didn't know all that at that time. I just know I'm feeling a little funny because I see everybody worshiping God, everybody with joy in their heart, everybody with their hands lifted up, praising and singing to God, and tears coming down their eyes. I didn't understand that, but something started happening inside my heart. I felt the breaking of the hardness of my heart coming in because I knew everything. So my brother's sitting right next to me, and of course, I'm just hard-hearted. I'm hard-pressed. I'm, I'm just fighting the very convicting and the power of the Holy Spirit from overtaking me. I didn't want to break. I didn't want to, to be humbled. And I felt the weep and the ache in my heart, church. And I didn't want to let it happen. I fought it all the way to the end. But I'm hearing the man of God preaching behind the pulpit, and he's telling Everything you need to know on how to be saved. That no matter what you've done in your life, you can be forgiven. Because of what Jesus Christ did on Calvary's cross. And he begins to teach and he begins to preach on Jesus, how he died for my sins. And that's why he came to the earth to restore us back to the Father. And so he had to go to that cross and pay for our sins so that we could be forgiven. So that our transgressions, our guilt could be forgiven in Christ. Putting our faith in Jesus Christ brings salvation to our soul. And that doesn't matter how bad you've been. God can forgive you when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm having a conversation with myself as the man is talking about all this stuff behind the pulpit. I said, that man doesn't know what I've done. He doesn't know the people I've hurt, the people I've disappointed. He doesn't know the things that I'm into right now. There's no way God's going to forgive me for the things I've done. But something just kept pulling on me. And there was a breaking that was happening. There was a war. Satan was warring at that very moment for my soul. And when the man of God called for us to go up and to receive salvation, my brother's right there. He's saying, if anybody wants to be saved, I want them to come up and I want you to acknowledge and to receive Jesus Christ into your heart and he will fill you with the Holy Ghost and forgive you for everything you've done. And that's what he promised. And all of, all of a sudden I felt this pull, but I wasn't going to go up there. No way, I'm not going up there. Mm -mm. My brother's sitting next to me and he just nudges me a little bit. He goes, you want me to go up with you? You want me to go up there with you, brother? And everything in me was yelling, no, I don't want to go up there. Because whatever was going on, going on up there, I, now you got to remember, I went in there strong. I went in there hard. And I went in there with all the pride I could have. And everything started to break off of me. I started becoming humbled at that very moment. And I knew as soon as he told me, I had to go. He says, I'll go with you. I'll walk with you up there to receive Jesus Christ. I go up to the front. Some of you have heard my testimony, but you got to hear it again. And I'm up there with some, I'm talking about some hard looking men that you know they've done some stuff they shouldn't be doing or was into some things they shouldn't be into. I'm up there with men, tattoos all over, and I'm one of them up there. And we're all pray, we're all standing up there and we start praying the sinner's prayer and we ask Jesus Christ to come into our hearts and believe me, I felt this weight fall off of me. This weight of guilt begin to fall off of me. And I felt these evil things beginning to leave my heart. And I know there were demon spirits that I was completely possessed with. And I got delivered that day. <laughs> I got delivered that day, church. I'll say it again. I got delivered that day. I got set free that day. Come on, give him a hand clap. That's why I'm here today. That was 20 years ago. And I'm still doing what God has called me to do. And he took me to the back of a room and I got filled and baptized with the Holy Ghost. Amen? That's how it works, church. Amen? 
I was perfect after that. <laughs> See, that's where we get it wrong. Amen? Satan lies to lost people that you got to get things together before you start going to church. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Because that's what I believe. Well, I can't go to work because you know I got I got to live right first before I go to before I go to work before I go to church. I can't go to church because I got to start getting my life together before I go to church. He said, "You go to church so God can start getting your life together." Amen. That means nobody's perfect. We all got weaknesses and strengths, phlegmatics, cholerics, sanguines, and melancholies. And we're gonna go into our temperament series. Welcome to the hand of God ministry. Somebody needed to hear that testimony. That's my testimony. That's what God did for me. What he did for me, he can do for you. Give him a hand clap. Amen, amen. So if you need a, a handout today, Brother Dell, will, whoever's got the handouts, did you already hand everything out? Just raise your hands if you need a handout. Welcome to those watching live, amen. Hallelujah. Tonight, we're going to look at the phlegmatic's relationship to God. We're almost home base, church. We're, we're, we're rounding third base, and I think we're fixing to head on to home base here. Amen? Who can tell me what the temperament means? What temperament? Well, let's, 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 let's go to Christian psychology before we dive in. Who can tell me what Christian psychology is? Brother Luciano. It's the sum total of who you are after Jesus saves you. Amen? Can that be changed? Can that be modified? Can your DNA... Well, what is temperament first? Anybody? Is that Brother Christian back there? Come on, brother, what you got? Your DNA. Basically, what temperament is, is your DNA. What that means is that's the way God made you. That means when you got saved, you're still who you are even after you got saved. But something happened when you gave your life to Christ. You were regenerated by the Holy Ghost. That means your spirit, man, is dead in trespasses and sin before you're saved. That's the lost condition because of your fallen nature. The fallen man that you received from Adam and Eve, that's why when you come out of the womb... We are all bent towards what? Evil. Because the or let's see, original sin is from our first parents. The origin of sin comes from who? Lucifer. That was a trick question. Okay. I said original sin and then the origin of sin. Did y'all get that? <laughs> Put your thinking hats on tonight, amen. The origin of sin comes from Satan when he was lifted up in pride because he was so beautiful. He was in love with himself. He just thought he had the most beautiful pipes that he could sing because he was in charge of the worship team. Amen. So he was in love with himself and he finally thought, well, maybe I can go ahead and dethrone God. Well, there wasn't much of a battle there. Amen. I don't think even God and Jesus got involved. He just sent one of his art our angels out there and they cast him out of heaven and now he's on earth trying to do the same mess here. He's always trying to corrupt man. He hates Christians. He hates the children of God. Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That is his main mission. That is his agenda. That is his MO. Amen? He hates Christians. Why? Because our worship doesn't go to him. Our worship goes to God the Father. Hallelujah. And he does not like it. He's still doing the same thing. He wants all the worship to come to him. And if you're lost, somehow you're still worshiping him. Because you're giving of your life somewhere to him. Come on now. So Christ came to redeem us from the curse of the law of sin and death. So our temperament doesn't change. But our temperament after we're saved, our spirit man has been regenerated it's been born again. We've been resurrected because we put our faith in Christ. But yet our sinful nature, our fallen nature, our flesh man has not been redeemed. That's the nasty thing we got to put under submission through the power of the Holy Ghost. 
And that is called to a daily job. You got to do that daily, church. We don't take breaks crucifying the flesh. Can I get an amen? Daily, I die to myself. Isn't that what the Apostle Paul said? I get up and I present this body as a living sacrifice unto the Lord. You have to present your body. That means that you and I, we mortify the deeds of the body while we're still on earth. Mortify the members of your body. Whatever's causing you to sin, you mortify them. How do you mortify something? You kill it. You crucify it. You cut it off. You sever it. Whether it's your hand, your eye, your foot, you pluck it out. You cut it off. You cut the foot off. You cut the hand that's touching the things you shouldn't be touching. You pluck the eye out. That's see, now don't come in here mangled and, and you're coming in like that with no hand on Sunday because you're taking it literal. It's spiritual. With the help of the Holy Spirit, you start cutting those things out, plucking those things out, cutting off the foot, those places you shouldn't be going to. You do it through Christ and the help of the Holy Spirit. You cannot do it in your own strength, church. You will fail. Amen? Not by what, Mike? No, by strength. But by thy spirit, saith the Lord. Whatever you are facing today, it has to be through the power of the Holy Ghost, church. Are you hearing me? You cannot do it through your flesh because the Bible says the flesh profits nothing, but it's the spirit that gives life. You cannot lean on the arm of flesh. Because what? The arm of flesh will what? Come on, church will fail you. Amen. As soon as you think you can do it in your own strength, you're done. None of us can fight sin. It's too powerful. That sin caused Christ to go to the cross and die. But you have to understand, church, that when you give your life to Jesus Christ and the spirit fills you, regenerates your spirit. That's the born again experience. The power of sin is broken. Can I get an amen? Y'all don't believe me? Go to Colossians 2. We'll come back to our... The Lord just gave me that right now. Colossians 2. I said, all right, Lord. I'm gonna obey God here. That's why pastor has to teach this stuff because we'll never get out of here. Amen? I love preaching the Word. Hallelujah. Colossians 2.13. Now, 13 through 15 church should be a foundation for every one of you in here that names the name of Jesus so that you understand your rights and privileges as a child of God. Amen? Y'all ready? It says you were what? You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet what? Cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. He made you alive. And your sinful nature, church, had not been cut away. Doesn't mean that your sinful nature is no longer active. But the power that had over you has been broken because of Calvary's cross. So it doesn't have to dominate your life anymore. But you as the believer have to do something. And that stay attached to Christ. Hallelujah. Look. I was talking to a young man the other day where we go get our, uh, our uh, pre-made meals. Because me and Pastor are always, we're super busy. We just pop that thing in the microwave and we're ready to go. So I'm talking to the young man there and I ask him, I said, have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Did you go to church? And what's your relationship with God? He says, well, I, you know, I, you know, I, I, have, I talk to God, but you know, I, don't, I don't need to go to church. I talk to God, though. I just believe that if you do enough good things, and if you leave the, the world in a better place than when it was, that's impossible. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> if you leave the world in a better place than it was, then I, I believe I'll go to heaven. That's what he said. That was his way of thinking, that he does not need to go to church, and he thinks that his good works somehow are going to get him into heaven. Those are two wrongs right there, church. The Bible says that our righteousness is like dirty rags in the sight of God. That means you and I can do nothing in our physical body concerning works that makes us in right standings with God. Our righteousness comes from what Jesus Christ has done. 
We are justified by faith and faith alone. That means you and I don't have to do anything in order for us to be saved because Jesus said it is finished. Everything he's done, he's already done. All you have to do is have faith in what Christ has already done. Amen? So why is it so important? We know that the sinful nature has been cut away, but there's something you and I have to do. This is for the entire body of Christ, not just this church. This is where the modern church is right now. They think they don't need the body of Christ. But the Bible says that we are living stones. You know what that means? Not the building. We are. Me and pastor are living stones. That means Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, and every one of you are living stones that make up the body of Christ. So when you come in, you're receiving nourishment from one another so that you can continue to be built up in your faith concerning Christ and what the Word of God has to say. So you and I have to do something. Most of the time, He requires so little of you when you first get saved, He just basically says, show up and I'll do the rest. Isn't that great? I thought it was great. Uh, That's a good time for me. Because most of my Christianity in the first three years, I just showed up to church and God did the rest. Even when I didn't feel like going, I still showed up. And God was doing a work in me. See, the thing is, we get into a place where I talk to God. I'm good enough. I don't have to be at church. We all need each other so we can continue to grow and become living stones. Every one of us make up the church. Amen? You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. Verse 14, he canceled what? The record of the charges against us and took it by, away by nailing it to the cross. The Ten Commandments that condemned us to die. Jesus took it and nailed it to the cross. And now he's seated at the right hand of the Father. That when you have connection with Christ, even when you miss it, you receive mercy and you receive grace. Because Jesus fulfilled everything. Amen? Verse 15, this is the most important scripture right here for your foundation. In this way, he what? He disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities, those were demon spirits. He shamed them publicly by victory over them on the cross. Can I get an amen? Hallelujah. Now go with me to page 135. Somebody needed to hear that tonight. I took a little sidebar. But we're still going to talk about the phlegmatic today. So we're going to start on page 135, and we're going to look at the phlegmatic's relationship to God. And we're going to have some fun with this. Amen? Y'all ready to read? Let's read. The phlegmatic, by the way of their temperament, by the very way of their temperament, is an observer. They observe life, they observe relationships, and they observe God and Christ. They let relationships pass them by, and they let God pass them by. (laughs) It is difficult for God to get into the phlegmatic's life because they never really let him inside. Never let him move on their life because they're so uninvolved. And because they have a tendency to observe. We're talking about one of the temperaments of the way God made us, is the phlegmatic. They're very uninvolved, amen? And that's a part of their weakness. And sometimes their relationship with God can go a little unnourished. And when you keep this relationship nourished, and when you keep loving God, your relationships around the earth will begin to change. Amen? This comes first. For God to begin to work in the life of the phlegmatic, they must first be introduced to God by getting them into church, hallelujah, or to see a what? An evangelist. Why an evangelist? Because an evangelist is going to tell you how to get saved. They're going to point you to the cross. They're going to get you in the body of Christ, amen, with the help of the Holy Ghost. 
and then you get in front of the prophet, pastor, teacher, one of the fivefold ministries, so you can start learning your covenant relationship privileges. Hallelujah. That's why you come to church. I want to know what the Word of God says because I know the man and woman of God are tearing away by studying the Word of God. And I'm going to hear what the man or woman of God has to say about the Word of God. So it's good to be in a church where they're preaching and teaching the very Word of God. Can I get an amen? There's some preachers right now, some ministers. I'll turn on the TV, and I have no idea what they're saying anymore. I really don't. Am I right? Hernandez is, is mostly a bunch of humanism and psychology behind the pulpit. We're not teaching psychology, church. We're talking about your temperament and the way God has made you, and that it comes with weaknesses and it comes with strengths, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, those areas that you still struggle with, God can perfect those areas as you start to submit yourself more and more to the moving and guiding of the Holy Spirit. You've got to allow the work to happen through you so something wonderful can happen in you. Amen? I know sometimes it hurts, but you've got to allow the process. God will be with you. It's not easy, but there's those times where you're just on the mountaintop and it's just beautiful. This is not really a difficult task, but they will most likely go along just to keep peace. Amen. Why? Because they're peace at all costs. That means when you invite a flag matter to church, they're mostly going to just say, okay, let's go, because they don't want to argue. <laughs> Amen. Let's just get it. Let's go. Once they get into church, they will sit back and observe the people around them and see how they are dealing with their spiritual matters. <laughs> That's okay as long as they're in church. Amen. <laughs> they're hearing the word of God. The phlegmatic will know what everyone else is doing right and what everyone else is doing wrong. <laughs> they're the ones that... That particular temperament, church, the phlegmatic, are the ones that observe the most. They're the ones that can be judgmental. They're the ones that can pick apart. They're the ones that can take the speck out of the eye when they have a log in their own eye. And that comes along with self-righteousness, believing they don't have any errors in their own life, but everybody else around them is the one that has the problem. But I don't have the problem because I don't have any problems. Amen? Look, if that's not you, the Holy Ghost has done a work in you. But some of these things, when you get saved, and you're still dealing with some of these areas in your temperament, you start to realize you're not as wonderful as you thought you were. Boy, you sit in this ministry for any length of time, you're going to find that out real fast. Amen, <laughs> Brother Dell. I can't tell you how many times I got hit when I was in the, growing in our ministry that we were growing in. You ever heard the, the, the term a hit dog hollers? No, these younger folks don't know what I'm talking about. Hit dog hollers. You hit a dog, what does it do? Err! Right? Doesn't it make a little noise when you hit the dog? Err! If you ever get hit in the ministry with the word of God going over you, just be quiet and don't let anybody know you're getting hit. <laughs> because the word is doing something in you. It's a good place to be, church. Amen? That means God is ministering to you. The convicting power of the Holy Spirit is going over you. There's something challenging you to come out from amongst them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. It's time to start laying some things down. It's, start, it's time to start growing up in the things of God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I'm glad I came on Wednesday. We'll help you grow up around here. Amen? Yeah, because it's getting tough out there. And it's going to get tougher. It's going to get a whole lot tougher. Tell you the truth around here, amen? The same we are the world stuff out there going on right now. It's going to get a whole lot uglier. And everything is lining up for the Antichrist to rise. Can I get an amen? God's about to wrap this thing up, church. <laughs> and you don't want to be a church or a Christian who's playing church or playing Christian that decides all of a sudden you're looking around and everybody's gone. What happened? Well, you were playing church. And God had been calling you to get things right, but you decided to ignore him. This is not the time to be ignoring the Lord right now. Can I get an amen? If anything, this church should be so overflowing right now, we have no room for anybody to come and sit. Amen? But we're in the last days. 
The Bible says there'll be a remnant left in the last days. And I believe that's here at HDM. There's others out. There's others out there. Hallelujah. Isn't that good? The phlegmatic will know what everyone else is doing right and what everyone else is doing wrong. They will also wonder what the fuss is about. They don't understand why everybody's getting excited. Because they're very un 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 unenthusiastic. There's no enthusiasm there with the phlegmatic. They will listen to the preacher talk about some of the things that can keep us out of heaven, like lust, adultery, vengeance, fornication. Since these sins require too much energy, they're not really guilty of any of these. However, just to be on the safe side, they take God further into their life. Amen? They can see that God wants changes. But the phlegmatic who is stubborn about change will fight this. No. They will justify their stubbornness by telling themselves that they are all right just the way they are. And thus will make no changes because it requires energy. Now look, if that's your temperament here, I'm a choleric, you know, and I was stubborn about change just because of the way I was made, the way God has made me, amen? He'll use how he's made you for his glory. Some of that toughness in you is there for a reason, church. We're just using it for the wrong reason. We're using it for the devil and not for God's glory. Hallelujah. That stubbornness to want to move from your commitment to God is great, but not to the point to where you're so stubborn you don't allow God to form Christ in you by allowing the word to have its place in you. And when the hammer comes to break up the stony areas, let the hammer, which is the word of God, do its job. Because on the other side, there's mas fruta. There's more fruit. Amen. But God's got to get some things out of the way. Some more of that love can start flowing out of you. Amen. That's the breaking. It's breaking sometimes, church. It's not fun. I know it's not fun. But the Lord is breaking so he can get some more oil out of you. That oil needs to flow out of your life. Amen. And after he breaks you, guess what? He blesses you. After he blesses you, guess what? He takes you. He takes sister because she's already, she understands what it means to go through the brokenness. Amen. <laughs> she knows. She's been with us a long time. This this prayer warrior right here, boy, I tell you, she's, she's been there. After the brokenness, she understands the blessing. And God has blessed her and has turned around and said, now I can give you to others. I can start handing you out now. We all go through this, amen? And it's a beautiful place to be because some of us come with a little more stuff than others, amen? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean... You're further along or I'm further behind. We all start somewhere. That's why the Bible says we hold an account for each other's faults. We make an allowance for each other's faults because we're still in this sinful nature. Amen. Love covers what? A multitude of sins. And we walk like Christ walked while we're in the earth. So they can see. Let's keep going. It says here they'll make no changes. This leads to what? Self-righteousness. When someone is self-righteous, they have a tendency to view everyone else as flawed and view themselves as what? Perfect. I'm perfect. Look, church, there's nobody perfect. There's never, there's never going to be a place in your Christian walk that you reach perfection. Hallelujah. There's no such thing as sinless perfection taught in the Word of God. That means all of us fall short of the glorious standard of God. That means that we continue to fall short of trying to be perfect with God. That's why we put our faith in the one who was perfect, Jesus Christ, who extends grace and extends mercy. And we have understood mercy and we have understood grace. That's the only way that your character can be fully developed when you understand what grace and mercy is in your own life. Then you can start to pour it out on someone else and say to yourself that I'm not self-righteous, but it is because of the grace of God. There I go. I do everything because of the grace of God. 
I'm able to preach because of the grace of God. I'm able to resist because of the grace of God. Can I get an amen? That's what Jesus gave us. There's power in the Holy Ghost. There's power in the name. Hmm. This flag, this causes a phlegmatic to become very satisfied in their own life. But they can do serious damage to their family relationships and their spiritual relationships with God. Now we're going to stop here on this page and I want you to go with Luke and we're going to finish up here in the book of Luke. Luke 18, verse 8. Because there is a place, church, doesn't matter what your temperament is. That we can become self-exalted and we can start to walk in self-righteousness in the things we do. I want you to hear me by the Holy Ghost. What that means is that. Let's take the usher position here in the church. Or prayer partner. Or the worship singers up here. Amen. We do those things because we love God. They come from a place that flow out of us to the greeter, to the social back there. Everything a man or a woman or child or teenager of God does it out of the goodness because they just want to do it onto the Lord. They do it out of a right relationship with God. They're not, and you have to understand, you're not doing it to earn or to gain or to add to your sanctification. Amen? That's where religion tries to come in. That if I do this, somehow makes me more holy. Hallelujah. Everything you do comes out of a thankfulness because of what God has done for you in your life. The weeping, the raising the hands, the praying, the worshiping, the heart of thanksgiving comes because how much God has forgiven you. That's where it comes out of church. And we got to understand that. Why do you think I weep so much up here? There isn't a time I don't come in here and I'm not weeping up here when worship is happening. It's been like that since I first got saved. I thought it was going to change, but it hasn't changed. I weep every time I'm in the presence of God. Hallelujah. The reason is because God has forgiven me much. And those who have been forgiven much love much. Hmm. And I know what God has delivered me out of. And I have that appreciation. And I understand the mercy and the grace of God. When I don't understand, I come to God and say, you know what I just did? And then you feel the forgiveness because you come with sincerity in your heart. And the Lord forgives you for what you've done. You don't really understand. You can't. We cannot really grasp and understand how God can forgive you after you've done what you just did. That is the mercy and the grace that came by the way of the cross, church. We have that. Man, and when you, boy, when you receive that kind of mercy and grace, you're a little bit less harder on others around you. I'm not talking about discipline and running your, I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about someone struggling with something. Amen. There's a mercy and grace that starts to pour out of you. I'm talking about the one who's acknowledged God and who's struggling with something, who hasn't denied the Lord and is struggling with something and walking something out. You have mercy and grace for that person because they're still walking some things out in their Christianity. Amen. Hallelujah. I love those kind of men. I love those kind of women of God. They may be going through something. You may be going through something right now. You may be fighting something right now. But you're here. Huh. Hallelujah. Come on now. Give a hand clap to the Lord. Amen. Give something to the Lord. <laughs> I know you love the Lord. There's no way, but we'll see if we can get this through in five minutes here. Are we there? Luke 18, verse 9. What's the heading say? The parable of the Pharisee and tax collector. Watch this. Listen to this. We're talking about self-righteousness. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their what? Their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. That's what religion does. Or that's what good works do. Amen? That's what people of the world feel like they can be morally upright and make it to heaven. Good morals keep you out of what? Jail. But Jesus Christ keeps you out of hell. Mm. Amen? 
I'll let y'all saturate. That's so good. I'm just going to let it sit there for a little while. That's good, Pastor. Whew. Good morals will keep you out of jail. Amen. Living right. It won't keep you out of hell. Only Jesus Christ keeps you out of hell. Come on now. The two men, this is Jesus telling a story. There's a bunch of religious folks around him, so he's throwing this story at him. He says, two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, that's the religious person, and the other was a despised tax collector. Now this tax collector, I want you to put yourself in that place of the tax collector, amen? And whatever place you may be in in your life right now, where you feel like you're not good enough. You may be in a condition where you feel like you're not worthy enough in God's sight. This tax collector is coming to church with another man going to church as well. He's going to the temple in Jerusalem. And he's going to pray and he's going to seek God. And these two men, Jesus Christ is giving a story to picture both and to see what, what's going to happen. Right, here. Let's go back to verse 11. Are you with me, church? The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people. <laughs> Cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector that's over there trying to pray to you. This is a self-righteous attitude. And the Pharisee, the religious person, we're talking about the phlegmatic church, who has a tendency to indulge in their own self-righteousness. Amen? Our righteousness is like dirty rags in the sight of God. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? This tax collector is praying to God. He says, I fast twice a week. I go to church every time the doors are open. He's probably, I read the commentary. It's almost like he's doing this. I fast twice a week, Lord. He's getting his stuff together. Because there's other people there. And he's saying it loud enough so other Pharisees and religious people can hear what he's saying. Amen? I fast twice a week. I give you a tenth of my income. I put tithes and offerings in the box. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. Verse 14, I tell you the sinner, not the Pharisee, return home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. What does it mean to humble yourself before God? This tax collector who was despised by the Pharisees, who's presenting his prayers to God and putting all his merit before the Father so somehow he can maybe get favor from God and saying, look, I've done this, I've done that, so God, you need to do this for me. The tax collector came a different way. This is the lost person, the one who comes to, his, to, to the end of himself. As I approached and received Jesus Christ, I came with a humble heart. I came with a sincere heart. That's how you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You come and you humble yourself before the Lord. How do you do that? How do you humble yourself before God? You realize you cannot do it without God. Amen? That's how you humble yourself as a man or woman or a teenager, or a child of God. You come to him and say, Lord, I don't got this. I don't have this. I completely surrender, and I need your strength to take this away. I humble myself before you, and I acknowledge my sin. God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. I take full responsibility. I take full accountability for where I'm at. And that tax collector approached God with sincerity. With a right heart. Are right, you hearing me, church? Clothing yourself. He says, those who humble themselves will be exalted. And Jesus said, that man who humbled himself went home what? Justified. That means, justified means he never, just as if he never sinned. And that's what Jesus can do for you today, church. The relationship of the phlegmatic to God. Y'all can close y'all's Bible. Let's go ahead and stand.